So we can start now. Good afternoon, good afternoon to everyone. My name is, is Jordi Quero, and I'm in charge of today's session. And I would like to welcome you all to this uh, inter-university program, Aula Mediterránea, this uh, collective endeavor, this collective academic endeavor to discuss current pressing issues at the Mediterranean and the Middle East region with, uh, with a really strong pedagogical purpose towards our students. And as you know, today's session has been organized by the Masters in Diplomacy and International Organizations at the FEI International Affairs at the University of Barcelona, where I serve as its uh, executive director. And the title of today's session is Climate Change in the Middle East, Impacts and Governance, Respon Governance Responses. Sorry. And we are pleased to have here with us Professor Michael Mason. Michael Mason is the current director of the Middle, Easter, Middle East Center at the LSE, at the London School of Economics, an internationally um, well-respected center recognized by the quality of its scholarship that everyone interested in the reality of the region, I'm sure, uh, closely follows. He's also an associate, prof an associate, associate sorry, professor in the Department of Geography and environment, as well and as an associate researcher at the Gratham Research Institute for Climate Change and the Environment. His work focuses on analyzing environmental politics and governance, especially on issues related to accountability, to transparency and security. As you can imagine, it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us today, Professor Mason. And in terms of format, well, we have arranged an initial presentation of around 45 minutes or so to be followed by Q&A with the students and the rest of the audience. And I will compile all the questions you write in the chat section while Professor Mason is talking. And later on, uh, we will address them. So you have the option to write any questions that you want on the chat section within this online venue. So I think this is all from me. Uh, so the floor is really yours, Professor Mason. Professor Mason. Great, thank you, Jordi. Um, and thanks to you and Elisabetta and all of the um, Institute for, for the warm sort of invitation to talk to you and your students across various master's programs. And of course, it's a, it's a shame I can't be there in person to meet you all and interact with the students, but I hope this online presentation at least provides some uh, value for, for the students. And what I'm going to do is I have a PowerPoint. So if this works, I will share this now and I will talk for about 40 minutes. I think if you can't see this, please uh, enter comments in the in the chat box. I apologize. I'm using a, a, a title which was advertised, but the content is the same as the one that you uh, uh, um, announced, Jordi. So um, yeah, so this is a big topic. Um, and so I can just give you a flavor of some of the key kind of issues and concerns over this 40 minutes. And of course, I'm more than happy in any of the aspects of the presentation to give more detail, respond in more detail uh, in the questions uh, part of the presentation. So the, the, the topic is basically climate change in the Middle East, a source of cooperation or conflict. And this is a, a um, very live issue at the moment, there's lots of, I'm sure many of you will know, there's lots of interest in the issue of climate change and its impacts on the Middle East. So what I'll do in this presentation is initially, I'll just give you some summary of the kind of key climate change impacts projected for the Middle East, and then uh, detail something about the governance responses in terms of both cooperation and then finish with uh, conflict is climate change a possible source of conflict and intensifier of conflict in the Middle East? And along the way, I'll give some specific examples. And I hope I think this um, PowerPoint will be available to you after the um, presentation. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to for the PowerPoint to, to be made available because it, it contains specific uh, sources as well, sources to academic readings and papers and so forth. So it might be useful for those of you who are interested. So let's start, oh, 
Okay, so let's start with the sort of key impacts. And again, um, I'm a geographer, so it means uh, um, I, you know, at least know uh, uh, something of the physical science behind this, although I'm not a technical expert. So, but if you want to ask technical questions about the climate change sort of modeling and projections, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to answer those, although I'm mainly uh, on the social science side. Um, so the key kind of uh, message in terms of the climate change science is that uh, many of you know that the sort of the, the climate change science is based around uh, extensive data collection and climate change modeling, which uses sort of uh, uh, observe patterns and trends in, in the past 10, 20 years or so. And these are projected forward, these sort of observations as a control uh, for um, then calculate an extent to which increasing greenhouse gas emissions might change the key kind of climactic sort of measures uh, around, particularly around rainfall, uh, extreme events and uh, temperature. Now, in terms of the um, projected impacts on the Middle East, I, the, one of the key impacts is overall um, climate change in the Middle East is projected to decrease precipitation. In this slide, you've got uh, two, two sort of maps. Uh, one's called RCP 4.5, the other's called RCP 8.5. Uh, RCP stands for Representative Concentration Pathway. These are projected scenarios developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to help model how what climate change impacts would be. The, um, the difference, they have four of these models. I just picked two models here, which are referenced in, in the paper, um, this 2018 paper. The RCP 4.5 is called uh, intermediate model. In other words, it's projecting what would happen if emissions start to decline around 2050 and a half of emissions by 2100 uh, decline significantly. RCP 8.5 is kind of business as usual. So there's no emissions decline this century. Both of, those, both of those in terms of global sort of projections are we're looking at with RCP 4.5, the intermediate scenario, uh, what the IPCC calls dangerous climate change. This is any climate change going over two degrees centigrade compared to the sort of uh, pre-industrial mean global average temperature. So it, the key thing here is even the intermediate scenario is projecting a rise above the so-called dangerous threshold, okay? The RCP 8.5, the worst case scenario, the global temperature rise by the uh, end of the century is a, a quite sort of major 4.3, 4.9, perhaps hitting five degrees centigrade increase compared to pre-industrial mean temperature. This is very, uh, uh, significant in terms of its impacts. And if you look at the, 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 the table, the, the figure, you'll see the, 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 the brown colors are, are terms of basically decreased precipitation and the blue colors increase. One of the interesting things here is we have um, seasonal variations. I just picked the winter rainfall changes to kind of match in with the sort of uh, rainy season um, for, for, for the Middle East. And what you see here is a drying a drying in the sort of East Mediterranean zone. This is highly significant in terms, for example, those countries that have rainfall dependent agriculture. But interesting also, this shows we've got to be regionally sensitive, um, increased precipitation on the uh, Arabian Peninsula over towards the East. There's no, uh, there are various uh, reasons why this is the case, or there's no scientific consensus on this yet. It concerns what's happening to sort of uh, cyclone tracks globally uh, regional pathway of cyclones, impacts of mountains on the Arabian Peninsula uh, in terms of more sort of humid air hitting mountain chains. But it shows you there is variation. There's significant variation, but there's the broad trend, at least in terms of the Mediterranean uh, Middle East countries, is in terms of this significant drying. If we look at temperatures, we're using the same scenarios here. This is, for, again, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change we see on the left for both scenarios, we have what's called a control period, which is observed data 1996, 2005. And in the intermediate scenario, we go across and we see the impact 
this is Middle East and North Africa. So we're looking at a temperature rise by the end of the century of at least two degrees centigrade and above in the Middle East. On the high emission scenario, business as usual in the sense that um, uh, there are no sort of uh, uh, climate change mitigation measures which significantly decrease sort of uh, climate change emissions. This is, the, I guess, the worst case scenario if the international regulation is ineffective, is uh, higher temperature increases. If you look at the sort of Middle East uh, region, we're seeing three, four, four degrees plus uh, mean increase in mean, in mean temperature for the region. So again, these are very, very significant impacts. We also have projected increased uh, impacts in terms of sea level rise. Sea level rise is a major problem uh, for those regions in the Middle East, those areas which are dependent or which are located in coastal zones. Uh, so for example, this is uh, projections for uh, Abu Dhabi uh, within the UAE, which has uh, 10 million population, 80% of that population uh, live in coastal zones. And here we see on the right, the sort of uh, uh, sea level rise impacts on the coast with two degrees rise in temperature and on the left with a four degrees rise in temperature. So again, we're seeing a very, very significant impact in terms of here, a Gulf state, and then we move to Israel, Haifa, which is a city of uh, 1.2 million people, uh, two degrees centigrade warming on the right and four degrees centigrade warming on the left. Um, it's interesting, um, the sea level rise in one of those areas of climate change science where there is some uncertainty about the specific impacts. Um, the, um, there has been variation in sea, level, uh, uh, sea levels in the, in the Mediterranean um, over, over um, historically. So um, over the past 2000 or so years, the sea level in the East Mediterranean has, has gone up and down about a meter. So there's, there's interesting historical record of previous sort of uh, uh, impacts of sea level rise. But we are looking at um, significant sea level rise, which has significant impacts on coastal population. Now, so climate change impacts, and I should mention also the climate change impacts of the region include uh, increased incidence of extreme events, extreme heat events, extreme precipitation events. However, my argument is at least at the moment, at least at the moment, at the present period, if we're looking at water and food availability, the, the key kind of uh, uh, impacts, or at least the, the, the key sort of um, drivers of water and food availability, physical drivers um, and social economic drivers are not climate change, okay? There were other much more significant processes going on. So we need to sort of outline what these might be. First one I'll just sort of uh, highlight is the, is the extensive groundwater extraction across the region. I'm giving you a summary here from an academic paper from a couple of years ago, um, which uh, surveys the declining groundwater reserves across the region and raises the alarm about what it says is the unsustainable groundwater extraction. I mean, unsustainable meaning groundwater aquifers are being, water's being withdrawn at a faster rate then the water is replenished by precipitation, annual precipitation. Largest uh, uh, reductions in groundwater, uh, um, Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, and Lebanon. Um, and in some parts of the region, quite a, a sort of vivid photograph on the left from, from Wadi Ram in, in Jordan is the uh, uh, use of groundwater at a very rapid, unsustainable rate. Here we see the use of groundwater extracted to, for agricultural use. This is not sustainable over the long run, okay? But in short term, it might make economic sense. I also would um, say that demographic growth is also, um, at least at the moment, and I would argue also going into the future, uh, a significant, highly significant impact on the region in terms of uh, demand on, on water, in terms of uh, uh, demand on food and working out the kind of consequences of climate change in respect to these other 
factors is a kind of complex puzzle. But often, it's interesting, often with the Middle East scholarship on climate change, we sometimes don't see uh, population growth mentioned, which, which is strange because it is very, very significant. Um, this is from a UN uh, population, uh, the um, regional UN body for, for Western Asia from, from several years ago. But I think it captures accurately the key trends is um, we see a very large increase in the population in the Middle East, in the, in the Mashrek uh, part of the Middle East, that's Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, and Syria. We're looking at population growth uh, from 165 million in 2015 to 300 million, almost doubling by 2015. This is happening uh, despite de declining fertility rates. There's also a very rapid increase in uh, population growth in the GCC countries. Uh, uh, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, where the uh, uh, both a, 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 a high reproductive rate, but also migrant worker sort of uh, uh, population there significant in terms of uh, GCC population. So population growth rate, although it's going down, population size is going up. This is highly significant. The third kind of area that I would sort of highlight, which is, I, I would argue, more significant at least at the moment, then climate change impacts in terms of water availability and knock-on effects of water availability on food is what I would call unregulated transboundary water flows. And this is uh, within the region, the extent to which uh, the key river systems um, are um, not being regulated in terms of withdrawal of water. And the, the, the key ones here, I think, in terms of un unregulated transboundary water flows of the Euphrates and Tigris, and which have been impacted heavily by extensive dam construction in Turkey and to a lesser extent in Iran. And this is having a major impact downstream in Iraq. I've just been um, completing some research looking at the water situation in southern Iraq in the Basra area. And there's a very, very significant sort of issues around water for Basra uh, region which uh, to do partly with what's happening internally in terms of governance, but also in terms of um, redu reduced uh, uh, flows as a result of construction in Turkey. The photograph on the right is the Ilusu Dam alone, sorry, the Ilusu Dam in Turkey, which is, at least according to some experts in Iraq, uh, reducing the kind of flows from the Tigris River into the Iraq by 50% and above. So that gives you just an idea of some of the key kind of uh, trends in terms of climate change uh, in the region. Now, the, um, if we go to what's happening in terms of governance response and, and perhaps some of the cooperation around that, initially, of course, we have international cooperation. And the key here is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC for sure. Um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is the key kind of go governance architecture for, for climate change mitigation adaptation internationally. It's not the only one. There are other uh, sort of transnational voluntary schemes, for example, uh, networks involving cities committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But in terms of uh, international community, the UN treaty system is the key one. Now, some of you will know that within the UNFCCC system, the Paris Agreement from 2015 is the most significant uh, current international agreement in getting countries uh, within the UNFCCC to commit to uh, reducing or limiting their greenhouse gas emissions through what are called nationally determined contributions. Um, I'll come on to those in a minute. I just thought I'd bring up this graphic, which is showing in terms of uh, uh, countries' um, emission reduction pledges under the Paris Agreement, these are nowhere near enough to limit global warming uh, uh, to two degrees centigrade. Um, under the Paris Agreement, there's commitment to, to, to make sure that uh, global warming does not go above two degrees centigrade. Remember, a two degrees centigrade uh, mean temperature increase compared to pre-industrial levels. Uh, above that is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, 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 calls the realm of dangerous, dangerous global warming. 
uncontrolled sort of uh, global warming in which global climatic systems are prone to all sorts of unpredictable um, effects, which might include positive feedback. In other words, uh, things happening which intensify effects in the short term. And so we have a whole kind of system-wide change uh, or flipping, as some climate change scientists call that if we go over two degrees centigrade, we're sort of going into exceeding certain sort of critical uh, uh, thresholds or tipping points, as often they're called. So we don't want to go, we, we want to stay below two degrees centigrade. I mean, Paris Agreement invites sort of countries to try to reach 1.5 degrees centigrade. And you'll see on the right with the sort of yellow line, current, current uh, um, um, pledges under the Paris Agreement are not enough to meet these sort of, uh, uh, to enable the, the global community to stay below two degrees centigrade increase. Now, uh, Middle Eastern states, uh, as members of the UNFCCC, uh, commit to uh, these NDCs, these nationally determined contributions. These NDCs are voluntary in terms of the specific uh, target, but the procedure under the Paris Agreement for registering these agreements is mandatory. Sometimes people say the Paris Agreement is voluntary, but only the, 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 the NDC the targets are, but the procedure by which these targets are registered and countries agree to share these is, is not. That's part of a sort of binding uh, uh, legal, public, international legal um, requirement. The Middle East states um, commit to these reductions with a, what we call a high level conditionality. What that means is that they commit to these reductions if they receive sufficient financial support or technological transfers to make these reductions. This is, I think, understandable. If we think in terms of historical responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions, it's, it's surely the sort of global northern states who profited economically from fossil fuel extraction for, for, for many years, for, 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 for you know, 200 years or so, uh, that we would expect that they should act first. So there's a kind of uh, uh, justice angle to the Paris Agreement and the idea that all countries should make a commitment, but it's, it's fair for those countries, international community generally, to support countries in um, improving, enhancing their mitigation commitments. The um, often Middle East states and the NDCs also uh, talk about the climate change adaptation measures. Adaptation measures have become increasingly important in terms of climate change planning in the region. Sometimes these are quite sensitive because they go into areas of like uh, social uh, uh, support, uh, family planning, for example, in which um, countries, Middle East countries, regard the international communities' um, um, expectation that they'll talk about how they will conduct adaptation as perhaps something which is not their business. Okay, so sometimes adaptation has, has sens political sens uh, sensitivities involved. This is from a paper, and again, I've give, given you a re, uh, reference to the paper. You can search. This is a, a, a um, um, paper in Vanta Research Letters, which classifies countries around the world in terms of their um, um, emission reduction commitments under the um, Paris Agreement. And what I would note here, and, and the, size of the size of the circles is basically gives you the size of the, the, the sort of uh, uh, total emissions from each country. I would just uh, um, alert you to the category four, which is bottom right hand corner, where we're looking in particular at the Gulf states, which have very high emissions per capita, some of the highest in the world emissions per capita. Um, but in terms of uh, Gulf state commitments, Gulf states, uh, none of the Gulf states in their NDCs are actually stating or committing to a specific uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, some have uh, reductions in terms of emissions intensity, but not uh, uh, specific emission reductions. This is, you might say, understandable. Gulf states are undertaking the transition from a sort of fossil fuel uh, dependent economic system into a kind of more diversified economic base. So there's a very interesting discussion taking place. Um, 
within those Middle Eastern countries which are richly endowed with fossil fuel resources uh, in terms of what is a transition away from fossil fuels, at least in, in, a, in, in, in recent years, many of them are trying to reduce uh, domestic consumption of fossil fuels, but that's often uh, driven by a fiscal interest in making sure that you maximize the export sales for those fossil fuels. Um, so there's a much more radical uh, transition ahead in going to a kind of a post, post sort of fossil fuel economy, uh, particularly if the international community's climate change mitigation commitments, and sometimes the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia have pushed back against these international commitments of climate change mitigation, uh, will, impact, will impact on their economies and will require, for example, that perhaps some of their fossil fuels some of their oil reserves, for example, would have to stay in the ground. There's a very big discussion to take place about the extent to which you might, for example, have to compensate states for not extracting uh, uh, fossil fuels. So let's see, in terms of cooperation, at least if you look at it institutionally, there are mechanisms. There are mechanisms that in, the, in the long established League of Arab States, the Arab League. There's a couple of bodies uh, which involve ministers of the environment from the various uh, uh, Arab states coming together uh, periodically to talk about kind of shared commitments. There's a council of ministers responsible for, for meteorology and climate. There's a climate change negotiations coordinating body uh, uh, within the Arab League, which uh, is supposed to facilitate sort of a combined position uh, at the UNFCCC, although sometimes there was a strain between the, the, the fossil fuel rich uh, 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 um, Gulf countries and other, other countries. There's also a separate committee on climate change within the Gulf Cooperation Council. However, and I will refer you to a, a, a study a couple of years ago um, from the um, uh, Emirates Diplomatic Academy in Abu Dhabi, which took a look at the existing climate change cooperation, which said despite these sort of relevant mechanisms and institutions, actually uh, they're not really uh, working effectively to drive a unified response. And they are not really sort of working in a way which is uh, setting out clearly defined regional targets, implementation mechanisms. Sometimes it's difficult to find out what these bodies are doing even. And they tend to focus on adaptation rather than mitigation. This reflects, I think, um, above all, the, the extent to which um, the Arab League and also the Gulf Cooperation Council are bodies uh, which are relatively weak. And it comes down to basically to the sovereign uh, sort of preferences of the leading countries in the region, for example, in terms of the, uh, the Gulf states, the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia, and that these regional bodies could do more, but at the moment um, they are not or haven't recently, and at least for the moment, um, not really providing a, a sort of strong regional sort of coordinating mechanism to kind of to, 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 to harmonize their sort of climate change mitigation, sort of cooperation, adaptation cooperation in the Middle East. Um, particular countries are kind of um, moving forward with sort of there is a recent change, I think, in terms of climate change coverage in the media in the Middle East. Traditionally, it was treated as, as foreign news, quote, um, in talking about, for example, the UN climate change negotiations and agreements. But I think there's a more recent awareness arising in the, in the region. Uh, this is often driven by non-state actors, NGOs, uh, civil society actors, but more recently also some state actors uh, in terms of raising the agenda on climate change. Photograph on the right is, is from the UAE, for example, National Environment Day. There was a recent uh, uh, survey or survey last year on eight Arab countries, um, interesting public opinion survey about how seriously people regarded climate change. And a majority in this survey, I've got I'll give you a reference in the slides of the survey, said 64% of people surveyed in eight Arab countries uh, last year declared climate change to be an emergency. Um, one of the things promoting the uh, uh, um, increased attention to climate change in the region is the framing of climate change in a kind of technical managerial way rather than, than in a political way. Okay, so there's, 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 there's a sense in which it's being framed as something involving, as we see in the photograph, individual responsibility 
around behavior, for example, rather than, rather than necessarily some kind of change to the political economy or the, or the social contract in other countries. Perhaps we can come back to that point in questions. So is it climate change a, a source of conflict in the region or a conflict multiplier? Um, most attention on this issue in recent years has focused on the, on the, Syrian, the, the sort of tragic Syrian conflict um, and the idea that the Syrian conflict might have been caused, or at least intensified, triggered in some way, by the extended drought in Syria between 2006 and 2011, and the impacts of this, damaging impacts in agriculture and the migration of farmers, from particularly from northeastern Syria, into the cities, disgruntled farmers, and somehow that spilled spill over into this sort of unrest. And, and protest against the regime. The Kelly et al. article in the, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is the kind of, uh, I would argue, the, the sort of one of the, the key uh, scientific papers in a prestigious uh, a journal, scientific journal, saying that the drought did contribute significantly to the conflict in Syria with displaced farmers leading political protests. Um, since the article, there's been a very lively discussion about the extent to we can attribute climate change as a significant factor in the in the Syrian civil war and I'm giving you here two references two very good sort of uh, uh, critical references which which contest this claim that climate change is a conflict multiplier uh, Jan Selby and colleagues um, in a journal in my discipline political geography looking at climate change and Syrian, Syrian civil war if you go to that journal it's interesting um, uh, uh, the Kelly and colleagues respond in a, in, a, in a response to the article directly after the Saudi article, then Saudi and colleagues respond to the response. So you get a great idea of the debate around this issue. And a more recent book, this is a book we were very pleased to, to launch in, in the LSE Middle East Centre uh, um, uh, earlier this year uh, with the author, Marwa Daoudi, um, which is the origins of the Syrian conflict, climate change and human security. This is also a really, this is a very impressive book um, in terms of going into archives, Syrian archives, uh, looking at sort of agriculture, uh, population movements, uh, migration and so forth. So very detailed evidence led assessment in, 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 in uh, which concludes uh, like Serbia are that climate change was not, was not a conflict multiplier in, in the Syrian conflict. So this is an interesting kind of debate, um, which is also being applied to other uh, sort of uh, conflict areas and areas of instability within the region. I've looked at this uh, uh, myself in terms of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, um, about 10 years ago, I was involved um, working on a contract for UNDP to help the uh, Palestinian Authority develop a climate change adaptation strategy in which we were asked to look at key climate vulnerability uh, uh, in, the, in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, in this context, it's interesting, both Israel and the Palestinian Authority do recognize publicly there's a serious risk of climate change. Um, so this is in, in their policy documents. Um, and in our work, uh, we looked at the sort of uh, what we call or what the UN calls, and this is also a term that I guess some of you will know from, from the human development security literature, the notion of human security, which was some which is a notion popularized by the UN UNDP. Um, and this is the idea in looking at uh, security threats or risks, in this case climate change, you focus on individuals, individual livelihoods and lives. So we looked at the extent to which climate change might be a threat to lives and livelihoods in the West Bank and Gaza. On the face of it, these regions are very exposed. For example, in the West Bank, um, 94, 95% of the cultivated area is rain fed. So you've got less rain coming, that's gonna have much, much more immediate impact than say compared to Israel, where you've got a large, uh, 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 strong irrigated sort of agricultural sector, uh, which is drawing on the extensive uh, use uh, reuse of treated wastewater in agriculture, so it's less rain-fed dependent. And in Israel, you have 
a key sort of move to see what see what a desalination uh, for 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 drinking water, which means Israel is very much sort of um, very resilient to sort of climate change impacts. Um, it's interesting in terms of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians over what's called the, the, the sort of um, uh, um, final status negotiations, the areas which are marked out for an agreement which needs to take place for a final peace agreement. It's interesting, although Israel is very resilient in terms of climate change impacts, it's actually used the prospect of climate change induced water scarcity to, as a reason to say to the Palestinians, no, we can't, you can't have any more fresh water in terms of the shared water resources, particularly in the West Bank. Uh, where Israel is, is, is in control of the uh, groundwater resources underneath the West Bank, um, which are used both by Palestinians and the Israelis and Israeli settlers within the West Bank. In our work in uh, UN, for UNDP, we uh, conducted a series of sort of workshops and stakeholder meetings where we asked those in the Gaza and the West Bank, uh, particularly representatives of civil society, representatives of, of key economic sectors impacted by, by climate change. Uh, uh, for example, uh, farmers, uh, we, had, uh, we identified agricultural sector as a key kind of vulnerable, vulnerable sector. We asked them to sort of uh, explore what climate vulnerability meant to them or means to them. We did this in a way of setting out what the scientists were projecting as the key kind of climate change risks so here on the right, you have a set of various uh, climate change risks in terms of sea level rise. This is Gaza, for example, talking about reduced precipitation, ver increased variability of precipitation and increased temperature. Um, and we wanted to get from the stakeholders in Gaza their sense of which of these were more important. And the size of these circles or ovals um, reflects the extent to which the, the stakeholders in Gaza this diagram was developed over a couple of meetings, um, which for them are the most important and how these, how they perceive these risks impact on their climate vulnerability. All these risks are feeding into the center in terms of um, um, reduced yield from agriculture, from increased groundwater contamination. So although there's a perceived loss in terms of reduced water, the key uh, issue in, in Gaza is groundwater contamination. A use of water from the, from the uh, aquifer, uh, the groundwater aquifer for Gaza, uh, in which the quality issue is actually more serious than the quantity issue. Uh, for example, the, the World Bank estimates 97% of the water coming from the groundwater aquifer in Gaza is undrinkable. Okay, so groundwater contamina contamination is a serious issue. This impacts not just in terms of people's health, but also in terms of lower yields in agriculture. Okay, so so far so good. Um, in, in terms so far so good in the sense that, well, we have some understanding on the right of various climate change impacts and the stakeholders are helping us understand how these impacts might link in to, to impacts on, on water availability, water quality, how this impacts on livelihoods to the top of the diagram and public health levels to the bottom. However, one of the uh, key lessons uh, I got from this work is the, um, the, 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 the stakeholder groups and guards were saying, well, you know, you know these, these, these are not so much current risks, these may, maybe they're projected future risks, but much, much more important for us, this is why the circle on the left is bigger, is the um, impacts of the closure, the blockade of Gaza by the, or the siege, as they, they call it, uh, of Gaza by Israel since 2007. And since 2007, there's been a repeated series of, of, of clashes, of, of, of uh, violent clashes uh, between the uh, Israel and, and uh, elements in Gaza, and uh, uh, um, both Hamas, the, the, the government, and other elements, other sort of uh, armed elements in Gaza. And the key thing here on the left is the it's a perception or the understanding that you can't separate you can't separate climate change vulnerability uh, uh, um, produced by uh, precipitation, sea level rise, or the physical the physical risks 
which climate scientists talk about from the specific current risks, which are very much context dependent, arising in a particular environment. And when it's a conflict environment or a conflict affected environment, as with this one in Gaza, then we need to take into account the impacts. And I won't go into this in detail. Again, you can, uh, I'll share this PowerPoint so you can look at this in more detail. And, and this, this, this diagram is in the UNDP report. On the left, you see a whole series of impacts on negative impacts on agriculture from the siege closure and how these feed in to impacts on groundwater availability and, and quality contamination, which is impact on the lower yield. So one of the big lessons for us from this work was the, 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 the uh, in terms of looking at climate change impacts, you cannot separate, you cannot separate the kind of physical climate change impacts from what's happening in terms of political, economic, social causes uh, of, of uh, stress on water availability and the impacts of water availability on, on society, e.g. food security, uh, public health and so forth. So, th so this is, um, uh, just to give you some illustration of this, looking in, uh, uh, when we did the work in Gaza, it was just after the, what the, uh, um, an Israeli military operation, 2008-2009, uh, couple of months, went in early 2009. Um, and you, there was uh, extensive destruction of housing. On the left, you have a, you probably can't see this, but actually there's a, there's a, there's a woman standing in the entrance of this house, still living in this, in this uh, precarious building with uh, a, a husband, an elderly sort of uh, uh, ill husband uh, in bed uh, behind her who couldn't move anywhere else. She said nowhere else to move. She couldn't stay in a, an accommodation. So when you're facing with this sort of stark impact from conflict, um, it's not surprising. It's not surprising that when you talk to people, they're going to say, well, you know, uh, what does this mean to us? This, this abstract notion of climate change uh, in the future? What future? We're just trying to survive day to day. Um, and so there's a need for international organizations. In this case, UN organizations to, to, to integrate the impacts of uh, uh, the sort of siege, the closure in the West Bank, the occupation on the Palestinians and how that these, th those very political impacts structure the vulnerability of the population to, to, to uh, uh, climate change and to other stresses. In the middle, you've got, um, this is a city in the South, Khan Yunus uh, of Gaza, where this is a huge sort of um, pool of untreated uh, sewage water, uh, contaminated water, which is, which is accentuating the contamination of the aquifer. Untreated sewage water, there's been some investment in recent years to try from international donors to increase the quality of the water is a big problem. This is, uh, this is much more of a key pressing issue than climate change on the right. Um, these are interesting sort of um, former Israeli settler agricultural enterprises. Uh, when Israel withdrew from, the, from Gaza, there was expectation perhaps that the, the, the Palestinians would move in and, and take over some of these agricultural enterprises and grow uh, agricultural crops, vegetables and so forth and export those. But one of the consequences of the blockade, of course, is the inability to, to export produce. And if you're unable to export produce, you can't earn income. If you can't earn income, then you can't pay to provide uh, goods uh, uh, for your family. So each of these three uh, photographs um, illustrates something where the immediate risk is much more significant than climate change. This is why in the title, I put climate vulnerability in, in, in quote marks to say that climate vulnerability here is, is kind of a phrase which is being used, but is it actually the most appropriate phrase to, to capture the, the, the sort of the acute human vulnerability, the human security vulnerability of the population in Gaza? Not to say that climate change impacts in the future may not be an issue, but is this the first place that we should be looking in, in terms of looking at human security or insecurity in Gaza?
So just to, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, to follow up on that if you've got specific questions about that, that particular case. I just focused on Gaza, but the report, UNDP report also talks about um, impacts in the West Bank. Um, so anyway, I would argue that, and again, this is, this is a big topic, it's a complicated topic. So I'm just trying to highlight some sort of key kind of areas and issues and arguments, hopefully. And I think climate change is actually less a source of pressure currently on food and water availability in the region, in the Middle East, and unsustainable resource governance, e.g. unsustainable uh, groundwater extraction, demographic change, and political economic constraints. Political economic constraints can include uh, conflict-related constraints, as in uh, Israel-Palestine, but also particular governance systems uh, uh, where, for example, uh, if we talk about the Gulf states, the political economy is based on a fossil fuel extraction model the so-called rentier state model in scholarship on the Middle East. Um, we should recognize that Middle Eastern states have made modest governance commitments to climate change mitigation adaptation. There is increased scaling up of, of renewable energy investments in the region, some, some impressive uh, uh, investments in the Arab states in North Africa, but also the, in particular the, the Gulf states in the Middle East. Um, unfortunately, in terms of cooperation, regional cooperation, the League of Arab States and the GCC um, have much, much more work to do to try to help uh, coordinate climate change sort of uh, policy making between the Arab states. And I think you might say, why, why would they need to do this? I think actually it helps them internationally if they have the coordinated front in terms of their climate change mitigation adaptation sort of goals and a regional, an effective regional cooperation body may be less likely uh, um, uh, or maybe more likely I should say to serve the interests of all the Arab states including the resource poor Arab states in international negotiations on climate change and in terms of conflict I gave you sort of uh, a little bit of an illustration from the Syrian example and the and the Gaza example I don't think climate change is a multiplier a conflict multiplier or intensifier in the region but I put not yet okay uh, it may be in the future as climate change impacts intensify that they may be significant in particular instances, uh, particularly around water availability and reduce water availability in terms of intensifying instability. Maybe in those, in those areas where there is a conflict existing instability or a lack of transboundary water governance mechanisms. Going back to my example, for example, about the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and the, the riparian states which share the Tigris and Euphrates um, not having a, a, a regional agreement which allows peaceful cooperation over what happens to the, uh, the, the water uh, from those rivers. Uh, however, I do think climate change intensifies climate vulnerability. Um, sorry, I, I do um, argue that conflict intensifies climate vulnerability, meaning that conflict um, instability creates a kind of conditions for human security, social, economic, political insecurity, um, in which in those situations, climate change stresses themselves are intensified. So in other words, rather than talking about climate change as a conflict multiplier, I think at least in terms of the present time, we're thinking the other way around, that conflict is intensifying vulnerability to climate change stresses. But often, as in the, the Gaza case, um, the, the vulnerability of the population to climate change is, is far less important. It's far less important at the moment to other sources of vulnerability. And that is the, the sort of the governance issue. One of the big governance issues in the international community is, of course, that uh, uh, the international community tends to deal with these issues, climate change, in a kind of uh, 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 sector issue specific way. And it's difficult to uh, uh, understand and address and think about the governance impacts of climate vulnerability in an integrated way, which understands what's happening on the ground, as it were, in particular countries, particular regions, in which the human population vulnerability, particularly around water and food availability, is accentuated by non-climate change factors. Okay, thank you for your time. There's also a, a short lecture uh, supporting lecture notes are written up.
as, as, a, as a short paper, which you'll have access to, which has also got some references in. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Mason, for these fascinating, uh, terrifying <laughs> comments that you share with us here today. Um, students are little by little sharing their questions with us. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with my own question as, as I give oh. them time to jot down any comments that they want. Uh, uh, to me, one of the most striking things that you mentioned in your presentation was, was something I have to say I never pay much attention to, and, and this is the increasing, increasing gap between risk and risk perception within the region that I think this is something fascinating. Uh, the, the question is, to what extent any potential gap between risk themselves and this risk perception by those societies might actually impact decision-making? So to what extent over uh, oversized perception of risk or the other way around, downsized perceptions of risk might have uh, my trigger might may have an impact on decision making and governance of climate change in the region. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting uh, question, Georgie. Um, I did some research several years ago in southern Lebanon, looking at a watershed which is uh, a, a transboundary watershed, Hasbani River, um, on the southern Lebanese Israeli border, and talking to some of the, we interviewed some of the communities down there and talking about use of the water um, and their perceptions of climate change. Um, and some of them and some of them said that they'd seen changes in precipitation and they'd seen impacts of the changes on their on their uh, uh, on their crops that they grew. Um, but that the perception was uh, as you would say downside in the sense well it doesn't matter one said oh you know is it one farmer said you know this, 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 this is, uh, uh, you know, this, this is uh, God, this is uh, whatever, you know, Allah, this is Allah's wish that if this is happens a season, the, the water this season is less than the rainfall that, that in the next season, well, you know, this is, this is, this is not something that we just have to deal with year by year. And what, what we, what we kind of saw in that context is, is the extent to which uh, any attempt to communicate what we would call scientific risk-based information has to be done in a way which uh, um, meets the kind of cultural uh, profile of the communities in which we're interested. So in other words, that it's not enough to, 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 to say to people, well, read the science or even, even translate the science. Uh, IPC are saying this, IPC are saying that. Uh -huh. Modelers are downscaling their regional climate change models for your region, this shows this. So you need to be aware that there, there'll be less water, less flow in the river, less water available, or, uh, or higher temperatures, which could be an impact in terms yeah. of, for example, on, on olive trees, for example, in, in terms of uh, not, not being so cold in, in, you know, uh, in, in the winter months. Um, these can have a combo, these have, you know, these will have an impact. And they say, well, you know, so there's, there's, there's an issue there. And also in the Southern Lebanon case, we, as in the Gaza case, West Bank case, um, encountered the, the, the not thinking about climate change risk as separately from other risks. So there we have an unstable border. You have clashes sometimes between Hezbollah and the Israeli military. And all these things were, were calculated in this kind of holistic way, mm -hmm. an everyday way, which is not in terms of scientific silos. So, and it means, I think, what you need to do is, is take two things, take seriously the risk perception of the group that you're talking to, mm -hmm. firstly, and if there is a gap between that risk perception and so-called objective risk, mm -hmm. try to understand what that gap is, okay? And, and not necessarily see that the, the, the problem, as it were, the problem is, 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 is lack of understanding or ignorance from the community's perspective, because often the community is a much, much more sophisticated day-to-day -day understanding of risk. Mm -hmm. They're integrating the experience, if not the formulation of climate change impacts mm -hmm. with other risks. Mm 
in that context. So I think it's a, it's a very rich area and it's something I think the climate change science community is pushing towards in recent years with the acknowledgement of the increasing role of, of professionals like anthropologists mm -hmm. in looking at climate change and trying to relay back risk, perceptions of risk in a much more specific uh -huh. way. Yeah, that's, well, that, to me, this is fascinating. I think this is like something really important to take into account in the upcoming years and, and, and how, you, oh, absolutely. how you deal yeah. with this is, is crucial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question here by one of our students. Carlos is asking you, Professor, uh, whether or not you think that climate change and environmental degradation might force human displacement in the region. So the connection between climate change and forced migration, and to what extent these, and to what extent, sorry, these actually trigger or might trigger new types of conflict to break up in the in the region. So connection between human displacement and and, and, and environmental change in the region. Yes. Uh, I mean, historically, climate change in the region has led to internal population movements and resettlement. You can go, you can go far back into the historical record and look at changing settlement patterns in, in the uh, Mesopotamia, in the sort of Euphrates Tigris basin around, mm -hmm. around changes in, 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 in temperature and water availability. Um, of course, we now live in a society in which uh, uh, arguably we're less dependent on, in terms of our uh, uh, livelihoods, um, on particular environmental conditions at any one location. But I think the key thing to think about here is, is at least in terms of uh, uh, recent population movements in the region, include, which, which feature large, large flows of internal displacement, large flows of, of, of uh, uh, um, refugee mm -hmm. movements across borders. The key, the key kind of movements in recent years have been clearly conflict related, you know, uh, Syrian conflict, for example, mm -hmm. and the, the, the sort of the, the regional uh, spillovers of the of the uh, conflict with with, with uh, ISIS, for example, in Iraq, mm -hmm. movements from the north to the south of the country. Um, so at least in terms of current or recent history, th this has not been significant. Okay, um, some some refugees arriving in Europe from North Africa sometimes talk about climate change induced reasons for for movement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, often, more, moreover, not because, and here we have an interesting governance issue, which is under the UN Ref Refugee Convention, mm -hmm. uh, being from climate change impact is not yep. reason a refugee at all. Yep. They're called you refugee status. Mm -hmm. There has been some, some talk about changing this, but there's actually been pushback from the UN system because mm -hmm. there's this worry about diluting the, the category refugee. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, so there's, it almost goes back to the, the issue about. Uh, perception how you present what's happening is that even refugees or even populations or communities moved by climate change because I can imagine it would happen in the region specific locations where there's for example heavy dependence on rain for agriculture and 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 these livelihoods are no longer viable these would tend to be poorer regions but poor, poor regions do not have the economic wealth to 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 to, to have other livelihood options available mm -hmm. And because one of the one of the consequences of economic development is the ability to import what what's called virtual water, water embodied in in agricultural products. In other words, you you replace water which has gone in your region with water which is used to grow crops in other parts of the world, which you import. And it's interesting. For example, the Gulf states are investing in in agriculture in Africa to to have this kind of resilience to to, to climate change. So there, there's, there's, uh, there's that economic development um, aspect, which means at least for countries which are relatively uh, uh, well-developed and have economic wealth available, this would not be an issue unless there's conflict. For the poorer regions, this might be an issue for localized movements, I think, for localized movements. But even then, when these populations move under the, under the existing international governance framework, these people are not going to say it's climate change when they arrive, often as they do in European countries, they're going to say it's persecution because they're, they're going to. And so until the international community changes its recognition of that, which is which is an open question, then this climate change 
displacement, although it would be, I think it would be relatively modest, at least in the medium term, could become much more severe towards the end of the century, um, won't be recognized as such, at least in terms of those making the movement, um, talking about why they're making the movement. Okay. So there is this, this other question, Raphael, who's uh, asking you a question on, on how do you see the similar uh, or different elements between the Syrian and the Gemini cases regarding climate change as a trigger of the civil war? So to what extent all the arguments that you presented in your presentation on the Syrian case might be applied to the Yemen, to the Yemen war? or the other way around, you believe that uh, climate change was an important issue to take into account when, when, when looking at the Yemeni case? Yeah, um, I think in the, in the Yemen case that, I, again, I, I would say, uh, you know, as in the Syrian case, that climate change was not a significant cause of the conflict. In fact, there's less, there's less sort of scholarship arguing that for Yemen than there is for Syria. Um, what there is in Yemen, which is sometimes missed, is the extent to which a, a kind of um, um, widespread, well-established communal infrastructure for, for, for water um, extraction and usage, often in rural areas, agricultural rural areas, using quite well-established traditional communal uh, structures to allocate water, manage water, was uh, completely dismantled, has been, uh, uh, you know, sometimes ir irreversibly damaged by the conflict. So what you have is, is, is issues, key issues around water availability with their knock-on effects on food insecurity caused by the conflict and not by climate change. So even when you're looking at what seems to be a climate change stress, you say, well, look at this village, in, you know, they have less water available uh, than they did in the past, you know, it obviously it's climate change. But then you look at, well, they did actually have a, a, an infrastructure, a communal sort of water management infrastructure, which has been dismantled. The people have fled or something. Yeah, the, 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 physical, the physical kind of um, uh, uh, um, irrigation structure is, is, is damaged. So again, we've got to be really careful as, as, when we go into a situation by saying, well, okay, there's less water here, which means it's climate change. No, often in, in the Yemen case, there's less water available because the water management uh, structures have been demolished, both the physical structures and the human, the human, you know, the, 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 the communities which, which nurtured those structures, okay? I won't get into the, the various sides of, of the conflict, who, you know, who's, who's responsible for, for, the, for the greater number of sort of human rights abuses, because both sides are, are, you know, have responsibility there. But just on this climate change, on the specific climate change point, um, I would argue anyway that there, there, is no, there is no evidence for climate change being a significant uh, impact or cause or intensifier of the, of the uh, Yemeni conflict. Great. Uh -huh. So um, a question on my own, and just to draw a little bit on the, on the positive side of, of this whole story. Uh, I mean, as, as we see in Europe, uh, the fight against climate change uh, is undertaken by younger generations. So we see a clear generational gap in, 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 in climate change opinion and, and the level of importance that different cohorts uh, of society pay attention to this issue. And as we have been saying for many, many years now that this is a region that is getting younger by the year, huh? the, 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 the demographic impact of, 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 of um, manifested in larger amounts of young people. I don't know to what extent in that respect, we can expect something positive coming out of, 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 the, of, of the region. And, and by that, I mean that uh, could we imagine these uh, great uh, gener new generations like pulling uh, for governance, trans governance transformation, taking climate change as one of the topics that can mob further mobilize them and, 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 and to, to actually fuel uh, these political mobilizations? Do you, can you imagine this scenario to actually take shape in the upcoming future, climate change becoming a critical mobilizing factor for those, gen um, for those younger generations in the region? 
Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and say yes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of reasons why I might say yes. Um, one of the last things I did before the pandemic was, was go and give a lecture at the American University of Sharjah mm-hmm. um, on climate change. And I was so impressed because it was, again, not dissimilar to this, but except in the, in the real world, as it were, of, of, of face-to-face interaction. Mm-hmm. I was really impressed by the, by, the, by the passion of the students. Yeah. And this, that was also a meeting where the students also presented their work. So, so I was able to see what they were doing. And, and, and the amazing diversity of, of topics from, from coral reef restoration in, 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 the, in, in the Arabian Persian Gulf to um, to renewable energy, to 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 to, to uh, um, food waste reduction, all sorts, and so the, so the reasons why I'm optimistic is is you do have that demographic bulge of young people, and and uh, and they've been educated, and 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 uh, the education is invariably leading them to to have a look at the world around them. And see, you know, and, and to try to understand what's happening in terms of, of, of politics and society, economics and environment. And then the climate change, climate change issue cannot be ignored. Okay, remember they're in a they're in a wired social media world. Um, and the, 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 the optimistic reason is that I think it's possible, and I saw this when I was at the, the, the conference at uh, American University of Sharjah, the the it's possible to articulate a concern about climate change in a way which is non-threatening to the elites. And I think this is crucial, particularly in countries which are um, uh, less open than, than your liberal, traditional liberal democracy. Yeah? Um, and in this situation, it's actually a good thing that young people, and sometimes this is encouraged, like UAE, UAE encourages Climate Change Day with its young people, and although I said the framing of that is often in terms of individual responsibility, you can't really control that, that, that sort of awareness. But it, I think it's actually in, in a good way that these young people are, able, are articulating interest, which is actually in the, in the interest of the elites in those states to take seriously, because they, 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 they will have to go into a kind of post, post-oil economic transition. And, and you see it with some of the young professionals coming up yeah and so that the, there's, there's there's the there's there's a way in which the the self-interest of these states can be understood in terms of enlightened self-interest enlightened self-interest meaning you're going to have to deal with climate change okay and climate change can be talked about in a way which is less threatening mm-hmm. and one of the reasons being is it's non-sectarian Mm-hmm. So often in the region, we have lots of sectarian discourses and antagonisms, but climate change is non-sectarian. Climate change mm-hmm. joins, uh, you know, groups together, joins religious faiths together, yeah? and this non-sectarian uh, discursive space, I think, is really important because, um, of course, there are so many trends in the opposite direction, which are polarizing, intensifying, but insofar as you have any kind of discourse which is necessary to, to, to be involved with. And the climate change threat is, is an existential threat in the sense that, at least by the end of the century, is, it could dramatically, dramatically change the way in which, in which we live. That it's in the interest, it's in the interest of these countries, to the interest of these elites. And then the second good aspect of that is, is cross-sectarian. And secondly, I think um, it encourages the growth, the steady, healthy but non-threatening growth of civil society uh-huh. because you can't you can't yeah. stop that you can't um, stop that, that that's and really I'm, curious mm-hmm. to, to me it's i'm not sure if i would agree with that but i think this is fascinating because as we see in europe i mean climate change has highly contributed to the politicization of of younger generations and my concern in that respect is that the elites perceive that as a threat in the sense that it starts uh, an overall trend of public blaming for not delivering that in a way might, might be the first step towards uh, increasing political demands by, by, younger society, by, by, by the jongers within the society. But I'm, uh, in that respect, my concern is that uh, elites perceive this as a first step towards something that they might fear 
more than 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 fighting climate change per se. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not sure to what extent this is going to play out in the overall governance of, of, of one the thing, issue. One thing which helps there is the fact that in in at least in the Gulf states, the elites are already going in a in a post oil direction mm -hmm. with, with with massive say renewable energy projects. Mm -hmm. So already and with attempts to diversify industry. Um, and, 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 and an interest, at least a declared interest in low carbon economic development. Mm -hmm. So they, they want the young people to be involved in yeah. this. And in that society, often the climate change expert is the engineer. And again, the engineer is yes. somebody who's respected and seen to be non-political. So, so again, again, I said I was an optimist. <laughs> but you know, this can be seen as a non-threatening. Mm -hmm non-threatening discourse of course you can't avoid it at certain points there are going to be political trade-offs you know um but at least you know th th there's sufficient there's sufficient awareness and interest that 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 you recognize you don't need everybody to sign up that mm -hmm. enough people sign up to to a, a a shared project another thing i think i might add to that is um i've got some colleague, colleagues working in my research center in, in lsc uh, in, in, uh, in the Middle East Center um, on heritage. And it's possible also to, to, to use a national uh, uh, patriotism as a positive source for action on climate change. Mm. That's a mobilizer, wow. You're looking, for example, traditional ways in which you use water mm -hmm. in the region, and you're validating a particular prior culture, which is often used anyway by the elites to justify mm -hmm their own kind of uh, uh -huh. state sort of oh. representation. Uh -huh. It's just steering, it's steering that, okay, we're very proud of ourselves as a people in the past. Did you know as a people in the past, we had these fantastic irrigation systems, yeah, which use water in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Uh -huh. So it's, it's what I would call, it's a kind of smart, it's a smart yeah. discourse. It uh -huh. nudges the elites, hopefully in a more uh, progressive direction. Uh -huh. I think that we are running out of time now. I mean, I could be here for <laughs> hours discussing about this fascinating issue. Um, let me thank you for your remarks, for your openness and for your kind in answering all the questions that we pose to you. Um, hopefully next year or in the upcoming years, we'll have the chance to have you here in Barcelona and to, and to meet you live face, by fa face to face and, and talk directly to the students. Um, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for all the rest of the audience and the students who have been here with us, uh, even if it's really late now. <laughs> so that, 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 that talks about the importance of the issue and how interested they are. And hopefully we'll meet you in the, in the future to discuss what's going on in, in, in relation to governance and, and climate change in the Middle East. Thank you so much, Professor Thanks, Mason, for I'm everything. Thank you that. And thank you to you and Institute, your colleagues, and, and especially all the students for... for for, for listening in and watching and for the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.